In 1972, Francis Ford Coppola released his epic crime saga derived from the best-selling book by Mario Puzo, which would go down as not only one of the greatest gangster films ever made, but quite possibly the best film of all time. In a fine example of life imitating art, it's well known that the hectic production of the movie had the involvement of some underworld figures. The role of Johnny Fontaine, the down-on-his-luck actor and singer who goes to Don Corleone to strong-arm some Hollywood producer, is thought to be based on Frank Sinatra, who famously hated the role because of these similarities. In fact, Al Martino, who plays Fontaine, essentially did the very same thing his character did. He was originally cast in the film by the studio but fired by Coppola, who wanted Italian singer Vic Damon to play the part. Legend has it, Al Martino went to his Don, Russell Buffalino, who is played by Joe Pesci in Martin Scorsese's gangster film The Irishman, and after a few phone calls, Martino found himself with the part again. The part of Don Corleone's ruthless henchman, Luca Brasi, ended up going to the 6 foot 320 pound world wrestling champion, Lenny Montana, who moonlighted in various roles for the Mafia in real life and is thought to have been on set as a bodyguard for a mafioso when he was spotted and cast. And as most know, he was so nervous about acting with Marlon Brando that he fluffed his lines, and this was written into the movie by having the character of Don Corleone so feared and respected that his own bodyguard and close friend stutters in front of him, with an extra scene being shot of Brassi practising his speech. Gianna Russo, who played the role of the abusive husband Carlo, had huge connections in the Mafia which saw him land the role despite being an unknown actor. And Al Lettieri, who played the role of drug dealer Solozzo, was related to mob members and drove Marlon Brando to New Jersey for a family dinner which may or may not have had mobsters at the table, to better prepare him for the role. These are just few examples of the heavy mob presence in the making of the film, which no doubt gives the film a more authentic feel, a trick director Martin Scorsese would go on to use when he regularly cast connected people and ex-mobsters in his gangster films. The story of the making of Francis Ford Coppola's masterpiece could take five videos just on its own, but what I wanted to focus on today was the connection with Coppola's movie and Scorsese's last gangster film, The Irishman, which stars Michael Corleone himself, Al Pacino. There are many links between the two movies. You could make the argument that Coppola's film birthed the Hollywood New Wave gangster film, and Scorsese's movie brought the entire world to a close. But it's not just thematically the two films are linked. Even in terms of the story, there are numerous connections. In The Irishman, it is claimed that hitman Frank Sheeran murdered mobster Crazy Joe Gallo at the Umberto's Clam House, largely in part to Gallo ordering an unsanctioned mafia hit on mob boss Joe Colombo at an Italian-American Civil Rights League demonstration. The shooting didn't kill Colombo, but severely disabled him. The Colombo hit is briefly shown in the movie, and what is extraordinary is that in real life it occurred just a few blocks away from where Francis Ford Coppola was filming the climax of his film, where Michael Corleone vanquishes his enemies. And what's even more stunning is that the mob boss who was shot actually had a major involvement on the making of the film itself. Joe Colombo was the creator of the Italian-American Civil Rights League, which was focused on exposing discrimination against Italian-American communities and wanted change. One of their policies, for example, was to have the word mafia removed from the dictionary. When the League heard of this new film that was being made about La Cosa Nostra, which would not only give Italian-Americans more of a bad name, but also draw attention to the actual Mafia, suddenly the filmmakers ran into serious trouble. The League strong-armed residents into putting up signs in their front windows denouncing the movie, bomb threats were called in, producers were threatened by mysterious voices over the phone, and the League threatened to put the Teamsters Union on strike, which would mean supplies to the film production would be cut off. It was clear that Colombo did not want the picture made, or at the very least saw an opportunity to squeeze money out of the production. Al Ruddy, 
the main producer of the film, was called to a meeting with Joe Colombo at Park Sheraton Hotel, which is known for being where mobster Albert Anastasia was killed in the barbershop, which, coincidentally, is also shown in The Irishman. During the meeting, Ruddy tried to make it clear that the movie would not demean the Italian-American community. He spoke about the equal opportunities the film offered, containing a corrupt Irish cop, a corrupt Jewish gangster, and so on and so forth. He offered Colombo a look at the script, which occurred during a second meeting, and though Colombo threw away the script one page in because he couldn't understand it, he made several demands, one of which was that the word mafia be removed from the script entirely. Ruddy, who already knew that the word only appeared once, immediately agreed. A second demand was that the money made by the film would be donated to his civil rights league, which Ruddy agreed to, but it's thought that the cash handover never eventually took place. What with, you know, the Colombo shooting and all. After the Colombo deal, the Mafia not only stopped the abuse of the production, but they actively became a part of it. Many mobsters were a part of the cast and crew, including the aforementioned Lenny Montana and Gianna Russo. They loved being around the Hollywood cast, and the cast loved being around them, as with the likes of Marlon Brando, for example, whose performance is based off mobsters who he saw on TV, of who Coppola sent tapes to him of, and of those he allegedly met in person. Which brings me to the title of this video. Was Russell Buffalino, the high-ranking mobster in Martin Scorsese's The Irishman, actually involved in the making of the most famous gangster film of all time? Well, apparently... Not only did Buffalino have involvement in the movie, but he had the final approval of the script. So this little man with a droopy eye, who apparently had a hand in the Bay of Pigs invasion, the murder of JFK, the assassination attempts of Fidel Castro, and the disappearance of Jimmy Hoffa, among numerous other historical events, was also involved in this historic film. For sure, Buffalino was a member of the Italian-American Civil Rights League. This was most unusual among the Mafia, as the general consensus was that Colombo was drawing too much attention to the mob by being at rallies and on TV for demonstrations. In general, the Mafia liked to stay out of the limelight, but Buffalino took a liking to the fact that the League was an attempt to better the reputation of Italian-Americans, and of course, there was also other benefits that the Mafia could wring out of the League. His membership of the League is referenced in The Irishman when Joe Gallo points out his Civil Rights League badge that he has pinned to his chest, and the younger brash mobster disrespects the wise veteran in front of other mobsters. According to sources, Joe Colombo's relatively tame demands made of the movie's producers were not the primary reasons he backed off but it was from decisions made by gangsters higher up in the ladder, namely Russell Buffalino. In general, mafia movies showcased mobsters as dim-witted and trigger-happy violent thugs. This film was different though, and Buffalino was intrigued by Coppola's vision to make the story more about an immigrant family than a gangster film, a Shakespearean tragedy of sorts. Buffalino may have had also seen parallels between his own life having come from Sicily as a baby with his family to start a new life. This new gangster film would show the corruption of politicians and the police force. It would highlight the constraints of corporate America. In some ways, it would justify the very existence of the Mafia. Buffalino saw something in the film that few other mobsters did, and he gave his approval for the movie to go ahead. As already mentioned, he personally saw to it that singer Al Martino got a role in the film. During the casting stage of the film, Buffalino visited Coppola and other members of production, and much of the mob influence on the film came from his blessing and power. In spite of his general distaste for singers and actors, he disliked Frank Sinatra, for example, who he saw as a wannabe tough guy surrounded by an entourage of bodyguards. Buffalino took a special interest in this film. He even visited the set and spent time with Marlon Brando himself in his trailer where he gave him a few pointers on mob etiquette and is quoted by Brando as complaining about his deportation case and how the US government was treating him. 
Brando is known to have modelled his Don Corleone on several mobsters. The voice, for example, is said to have been inspired by either Frank Costello or Carlo Gambino. Another influence is thought to be Joe Profacci, and the respectful manner, quiet nature and low-key danger emitted by Brando's magnificent Oscar-winning performance may have come from Russell Buffalino himself. The sources for the information in this video are numerous, from online articles, newspaper clippings, biographies of Marlon Brando and Charles Brandt's novel I Heard You Paint Houses, which the Irishman is based off. The primary source of information is Matt Birkbeck's highly researched and informative book The Quiet Don, the untold story of mafia kingpin Russell Buffalino. It's an excellent book for mob fanatics and I've included a link in the description below. So what do you think? Does it sound plausible that this high-ranking gangster had a hand in the making of the best gangster film of all time, even meeting the titanic actor Marlon Brando himself, sitting with him in the actor's trailer? Or do you think that these are exaggerated fantasies by book authors looking to make a few extra bucks? Let me know in the comments below and thanks for watching.